So the past few years, I've just been practicing and trying to understand the platform as I'm sure you have and many other content creators have. And the way I look at it is like, okay, well, there's you, the message, there's the audience, the thing that they want, and then the platform. And I think most of the time content creators, and this was me early on, it's like, they just think it's about you. It's like what you have to say. And eventually you realize, oh, well, there's an audience that you have to serve. But most people stop there. Most people don't understand how the platform actually works. And I think I've invested a lot of time in the past few years trying to understand how that works from the SEO aspects, yeah. uh, from uh, retention, how that works, uh, the relationship between Google and YouTube and other platforms. Like how does the web work? How does uh, SEO work on a global scale? And then how does that affect something that's searchable like YouTube? What is going on, everyone? It's Justin and Brandon here back with another episode of the Featured Podcast. And first off, we want to give a huge thanks to the first 20,000 listens on the podcast. And if you haven't already, make sure you go ahead and leave a review over on Apple Podcasts. But today we're joined by a very special guest, Matthew Encina. That's and right. you may have seen one of his desk setup tours before because even though he only makes a few videos a year, his three main setup videos combined have over 10 million views, which Crazy. makes full timers like me look like we don't know what we're doing. And with with good reason. I mean, it's a great setup. Mm -hmm. One of the most effective, both in terms of productivity and visuals, utilizing IKEA and different mix and match pieces. And in general, just giving a lot of inspiration, which was actually the inspiration behind one of our most recent setup makeovers. So we're going to talk about workspaces, the different elements and what contributes to it, and also the productivity hacking side of things, which Brandon is into. Yeah, Matthew seems like he's been focused on productivity for a while. And I'm looking at diving into what sort of hacks he's been obsessed with lately and how he sort of evolved his setup to where it's at the point it just works seamlessly for him so i'm looking forward to having this conversation for sure it's almost like a polar opposite to my current kind of setup i feel like the way That's that right. i work instead of like breaking things down into like 90 minute windows 60 minute windows doing scheduled calendars like he had us do for this podcast i just go ahead and uh <laughs> run around all over the place and try to do 10 things at a time. So maybe I can learn a lot from this episode. Uh, so without further ado, here's Matthew and Sina from the future. So how have you been? Yeah. Uh, uh, good, really good. Uh, despite being locked up at home for a long time, uh, I'm actually really enjoying this um, focus time, quiet time. Yeah. I'm not a person to go out a lot and socialize like crazy. so. Being locked up is actually has done wonders for my focus and creativity. Yeah, I can't wait to learn more about that and how it's evolved even through COVID with being so in a space where you're intimate with yourself and you, you don't really have the distraction of socializing. It was a lot of people mm -hmm. with COVID. They, no events they have to be at, uh, no friends asking to hang out, how they've been able to implement that into their free time and really work more and work more efficiently. I think like the unique yeah, situation is that you've already got like a beautiful desk set up and a lot of people totally. right now, we noticed in the setup makeover series that people were watching even the old setup makeovers to figure out ways that they can improve our workspace. Whereas as someone like yourself in the tech industry uh, and in the creative space who already has like a, like a great setup, it's almost like you finally get to spend more time at it. Yeah. And lucky for me, it wasn't a huge transition because I was already spending about two or three days a week working from home uh, just because I liked mixing up the environment. But now I have no choice. Yeah. But luckily, I spent all this time <laughs> investing into making this spot uh, more cozy and, and really fit for my needs and, and work for me. For sure. Yeah. So I think uh, we, we just want to start it with like a nice little introduction. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about yourself, uh, the future and kind of kind of what you want us to know. Sure, yeah, so uh, my name is Matthew Encina. I'm the Chief Content Officer at The Future where we create content, educational content for creative entrepreneurs to help them grow. Uh, on the side, I make content on my personal channels about productivity, tech, lifestyle. And in a past life, I've spent over a decade in the branding and advertising space. So here I am now, <laughs> harnessing all of those experiences and uh, talking with you guys, connecting on things that we both mutually like, which is tech, design, all that stuff. For sure, yeah. I think like um, 
I found you on YouTube, of course, and I know like your your desk setup tour is probably one of the most successful ones that is that has ever been on the platform. And I've been doing like desk setups for many years now, and some of them have done pretty well, like into the millions. But yours is like easily the best one that I've seen so far. So I think um, there's a good reason for that. And I think we want to talk about what are the like most important characteristics in an effective setup and how do you compare like aesthetics versus function when deciding what goes into a space? Because I think as people who enjoy tech, we often find a lot of things that we want and we just want to throw it in the space. But in a lot of cases, less is more and a lot of stuff just goes unused or it takes up space and adds clutter. What's kind of your strategy behind constructing a setup? Yeah, I think a lot of the ideas or frameworks or way that I look at my space is much like I, I do my work because my background is in graphic design and content creation. It's all about reducing down just to the essentials. So design is all about form and function. It can't be one or the other. And so when I look at my space, I approach it the same way. Uh, I think about what do I need in order to do the work that I'm currently doing? And then I design around that. So function first, I think about that. And then I obviously lean into the aesthetics. Well, what's going to look nice? What's going to look cohesive? Um, How many materials, different kinds of materials am I going to put in here? And how am I going to pare that down so that um, it both serves the purpose and it looks good? For sure. Yeah. Like uh, I know, like with Ikea, there's a lot to get creative with. They have a lot of different lineups. You've got the Linman, Mm -hmm. uh, you have the kitchen countertop and the kitchen countertop is actually something that is very recommendable because the quality is great. It's durable. doesn't bend at the middle, comes in a few different finishes. And so I think that kind of wood element does add a bit of life to the space. Um, And that's what I've noticed has been very popular in the area. Uh, What are like some of your tech essentials that you would put into a desk right away and, um, kind of like go-to products, ones that you think are the best for like the widespread audience? Right. Uh, well, you can't do work without a computer. So for me, like I've, I've always been a Mac guy. Like I grew up on PC, but then went over to Mac. So yeah. my uh, at the center of it all is my 16-inch uh, MacBook Pro. That thing is a beast. You know, I maxed it all the way out, even though I <laughs> regret how much I pay for it. Like the because it has eight terabytes it has 64 gigs of ram like that thing is solid so that's definitely at the center of it all Uh, another piece that i really like uh, are these headphones these are uh, the tma2 Uh, i just got these these are the wireless versions yeah Yeah, those have been around for a while actually yeah i've I've had my pair since 2014 and they look awesome yeah and they just they've worked very well i've never had to replace anything uh aesthetically they look beautiful they're very minimal but also in terms of quality they've still held up so that's really important for me um and then some of the other tech like i've i've really am loving the uh logitech mx series for both my keyboard and mouse i think i know a lot of people prefer mechanical keyboards but for some reason i tried it (laughs) Uh, it's not for me like uh, maybe Mm -hmm. this is a programmer thing i'm not really sure but for my hands i just like it really low i like the tactile feel and i like how minimal it is it's not so crazy with the branding or rgb lights or anything like that so it's all pretty simple and very comfortable to to work on for sure, yeah. Like, um, I get what you mean with the mechanical keyboard thing. I tried the Keychron for a week or two and just couldn't really get used to it. Uh, so I personally used like the the Apple keyboard that came with the computer, and then the MX Master Three, which has been that entire lineup ever since the MX Performance back in the day has been kind of a go-to for creatives. I think the horizontal scrolling, the ergonomics, and everything. Um, how have like your setups evolved over the years? I know a lot of times uh, when you put together a great desk setup, even though it may look perfect at the time, there's always some small changes mm-hmm. and like a phase that you want to add to it. And I noticed in your channel, you also had the the shelf that you added um, on top of the, the whole setup and kind of mm-hmm. like incremental updates to improve. Uh, how have your setups changed like recently and even dating back in the day? Like was your style completely different or have they all kind of remained quite similar over the years? Yeah, so I think for most of my spaces, again, I approach it like a designer, so I think about the function. And because the nature of my work changes, like we as people, we change every single day, we change every year. So the the nature of the things that we do uh, changes all the time. So for me, it's having to make those adjustments to make sure that it's still serving the purpose. So back in the day, I was doing a lot more uh, management at the office. So I didn't really need a crazy, heavy 
a PC or Mac setup. So I was just rocking an iMac, mostly for emails and typings and coordinating with people. Um, over the years, more recently, I've gotten a lot more into content creation myself. So a few years ago, back in 2017 and 18, uh, I did a lot of commercials for Xbox, and that required yeah. tons and tons actually. of. Oh, thanks, like man. Like the case yeah, study, yeah. I think you. Uh, I went to the website and took a look at the work uh, back when I first found your channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that required uh, a heavy GPU setup, so I had to build yeah. a, a custom PC for that, loaded up with three uh, 1080 Ti's back in the day. And so, you know, my station was built around that. And more recently, because I'm doing more content creation, because I'm at home, I've had to gear up. So I have more cameras, more lenses, and I just ran out of places really to, to store it all. And I didn't have a good system. So all of these things have been progressively updating over the years in terms of my needs and uses. And um, I'm trying to I'm getting more, let me try and phrase this properly. You know, I, I grew up with immigrant parents and they like to hold on to things. Like I think they still have uh, some things that they've owned for maybe 30 years. There's still and a I grew stuffed up with animal and, a, and like a natural wood table down in this basement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just like, uh, you know, and I appreciate growing up with that uh, mentality yeah. of not having to be wasteful and trying to reuse stuff as much as possible. But over the years, you know, I, I saw that as something that becomes in turns into hoarding easily turns into hoarding. And then you have this uh, sunk loss bias where you feel like, well, I've had this. I spent, you know, a thousand dollars on this thing. Yeah. I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> but if I think about it, it's like, well, if if I had the option to buy this today, would I still buy it? And if the answer is no, usually that means, you know, I could get rid of it. Yeah. I, I just changed my mentality from how much did I spend on it versus maybe I just rented this for a long time. And yeah. that's how I kind of visualize it in my mind. It's like, okay, well, what's going to serve me right now? And I keep adjusting based off of that. And with YouTube, it also makes it easy to justify certain things that aren't needed. Like, oh, I can use it for content <laughs> or the longevity of it, or, oh, this is a write-off because we're making a video about it or stuff like that. So I think... Um, my parents are very organized uh, and they, they do like to hold on to things for a really long time. Who knows, I might be adopted or something, but I, <laughs> I literally keep, like I, I, I'd say I get rid of stuff pretty easily, but I also hoard stuff faster than I, than I like. So I need, from watching your videos, I do need to like kind of learn a proper system and how to get organized because I think over the years as the amount of stuff has piled up, I still haven't really found a system for it. Like my house is full of like tripods, lights, mm -hmm. new tech, and it's just like in the kitchen, it's on the couch, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, that's the nature of your channel and a lot of your work. You <laughs> review and, and show show that off. So it's like it's it's important. It, you know, it's part of the thing. Like that's not necessarily what I do, but I'm starting to warm up to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I never got into this space really for any real objective except to create content. Yeah. And try and explore and have fun. But it was never to be uh, a tech reviewer. And that's something that's starting. I keep getting inquiries weekly for those things. It's like, oh, can you review my product? Can you review my product? Amazon. And I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like the overnight probably emails. for the past. Exactly. <laughs> Every email. And, you know, I have to turn down almost all of it because I yeah. just tell them I'm not a tech reviewer. I'm not a tech reviewer. But I'm starting to think, it's like, well, if that's what they're thinking about me, if that's what they're saying about me, maybe I am because that's my inadvertently my my brand, right? It's not what you say about yourself. Certainly you can influence that, but it's what other people think about you and that's your brand. And so I, I'm very aware of that. I'm starting to lean into that and trying to figure out how am I going to influence that perception of me? And then <laughs> what's the future of my channel, my content uh, on the personal side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like what I've noticed uh, as as someone who's been in the tech space for a while, the perspective that you bring to the workspace and, and tech, which like with desk setups, it is very predominantly the tech audience, uh, the male tech audience. Mm -hmm. We noticed some of the setup makeovers had a 98% uh, male audience. And um, I think what's unique in what you brought is that you also integrate a lot of like the lifestyle and how to organize time, how to organize spaces, whereas a lot of us just look at the tech side of things and maybe some of the visuals as well. Um, so like looking at the, the performance of these videos, I think um, like, yeah, these companies see a lot of the tech side, but they also see that you're, you're different from the average tech creator and the fact that you work in the creative field and you have the experience and you're bringing that kind of 
life hacking and and productivity information to the channel as well whereas a lot of us just like play and review tech read the specs and talk about the experience within that's what we're used to um so i think that's what i personally noticed that the new perspective that you bring um is is really special mm -hmm. one uh, thing i was curious about is how you integrate the health components into your setup that might not make the youtube videos like recent research regarding like essential oils and grounding mats and where you place mm -hmm. your coffee on the desk i mean the cues <laughs> how um like what sort of cues do you have for yourself to really get into your workspace that might not make the videos yeah i mean i'm not too crazy on uh the health aspect in terms of understanding that well you know i looked up a few ergonomic videos mm -hmm. <laughs> and then i based it off of that you know nine degrees this when you're standing do this uh, make sure to stand up every hour or whatever <laughs> like you know i try to follow those things and i cycle and then i adjust based off of what actually feels good for my body and my productivity yeah. mm -hmm. so those things it's like i'm constantly learning i'm applying and then adjusting and then learning again because um new information is always out there there's new things to learn and and i'm one to not hold on to a belief for too long and as soon as there's another way that potentially looks better i'll try it and then implement the things that actually resonate and are relevant to me so you know I'm, i don't claim to be any kind of expert in that space but i do like to learn i do like to constantly improve and just make little iterations in many parts of my life what was something that you integrated recently that you found you've gotten a lot of value from yeah, I think the biggest, one of the, the biggest things that I've updated in my space, which was in my 2020 uh, update video at the beginning of the year, was uh, installing uh, IKEA Best the Unit right over my desk. So before I just had a skinny shelf up there that revealed a bunch of uh, just a very simple like YouTube uh, camera setup, which is like an ADD, uh, a little tripod and a mic, right? Like that's all I had. But since then, uh, my my needs have grown quite a bit and I've gotten a lot more gear and I just needed a way to store all of that in a way that looks minimal where I could cover it, but it's yeah. easily accessible so I could just grab it. So uh, that was actually one thing, overhead storage, utilizing my vertical space. Both of those things have been um, instrumental for me to just be able to keep everything at bay, keep everything contained because I, I hate the idea that I'm building up more stuff uh, and I just don't want it to get out of control. So, uh, you know, that's just a way for me to keep it organized and still keep it functional. With video especially, it is easy to <laughs> stack up a lot of equipment like the new microphones or this microphone's for this, this one's for sit down um, and lenses and then like the lights especially take up a lot of space and, and everything. Um, so yeah, like the, the organization system um, it's uh it's it's something that's kind of ongoing um but i think uh, another question that i noticed um in your video was that you uh you also focus a lot on using software to assist productivity uh in the the way you structure your day um i recently started using notion i still don't know that much about it i'm very very new to it um my buddy ali has been giving me some some opinions on how to use it effectively and uh, i'm still trying to integrate completely we're still using apple notes for a lot of things and it's just like shared mm -hmm. notes and it's just a huge mess um how important would you say technology is in assisting productive habits and daily routines i uh, noticed you had like the amazon alexa or it was the amazon echo that has the yeah. time displayed on it uh where you run by the 90 minute and the 20 minute break kind of structure mm-hmm yeah, I mean, tech is tech, and I've adopted so many different project management and productivity things over the years. But what I realized is that whatever you stick to works. That's all it that matters. It doesn't matter the software or the tech. It's just the system that you choose to uh, stick to. Uh, the thing about me is just because of the people I work around. Again, I don't hold on to beliefs for too long. Just because I had a system at one point doesn't mean that it can't be improved. Yeah. So at, at my workplace, whenever there's a new piece of software that potentially can improve our workflow we just adopt it right away company-wide it's not yeah. like one of those things where it's like well it's going to take two years to adopt and get yeah. everybody <laughs> on board it's just like no let's try it let's try it let's try it for a week and then see what happens yeah if it doesn't work out well then let's just let's make adjustments or pick up the parts that actually uh, are relevant so for me you know i've tried many many different things i use notion really to 
uh, keep all of my notes, keep all of the things where I'm, you know, researching, doing uh, knowledge uh, consumption, and I'm keeping all my notes there. I track all of my personal projects and my work projects on there. And I have all my goals listed on there so that I can just keep that. And, and that's very helpful for me to track stuff in the long run. But in the short run, the only thing I use, the most effective thing is is this guy right here, which is just a post-it note. So my, my productivity, like my biggest productivity thing is, is write down as many things as I can fit onto one post-it note for any given day. And that's all I'm going to complete. That's all I'm going to commit yeah. to because anything more is crazy. And that's just too much multitasking. So, so that's been actually the most effective, um, system that's analog that gets stuff done for me. <laughs> yeah. Going back to like the topic of like, how, how do you, What's like the strategy to getting everybody on board to trying new software? I think um, I've always been working in a relatively small team and a lot of times I know it starts with myself switching over to it, but then getting everybody else to use it equally as much is difficult. Like there's always one person who uses a little bit more than others. Is there like mm -hmm. any tips or ways that, that everyone is able to transition to a new piece of software at the same time? Because uh, software is not easy to learn. I know like Notion from in the beginning was a little bit intimidating and it took me a really long time to use it. And it wasn't until we hired a podcast editor that he created a Notion template for our podcast, like the different statuses, the Instagram quotes and everything and how it all comes together. That is where I really saw the value in it. But on my own, like mm -hmm. going into that new software, I don't think I would have been able to create anything nearly as effective as that. Yeah, I, I think... Um uh, two things. The first thing is because we live in the age where you could search anything on Google or YouTube and you will find the answer. Seeing use case for what you intend to use it for is very helpful. So I'm, yeah. for me, Notion was the same way. I saw it as a blank canvas and anything's possible. And that's so intimidating. But as soon as I started looking up videos or as soon as my intern at the time, maybe three years ago, showed me, oh, you could build this database and do this. Yeah. Once I saw the use case, then it made sense. Then I started building from there and continued to do research. Um, in terms of adoption inside the company, inside a group of people, uh, the most helpful thing that I've seen is just applying it to one project, not trying to shift the whole company and all the processes and systems that you have in place, <laughs> but just one project. So yeah. if you have an upcoming video, you might try and organize one video on there. Yeah. Have everybody just say, you know, for one week, let's just commit to this until this project is through. Everything else, you're going to run on all the old systems yeah. and just see what happens beginning to end. Then when that project is done, you just reflect. It's like, well, you know, where was this good? Where did it fall short? Uh, what can be improved and is this worth continuing down? And if you see a lot more improvements in workflow, because a lot of these tools are designed for specific workflows in mind. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Uh, Frame.io is built just for reviewing videos and sending that out to clients or sending that out to your team to get feedback uh, until the project is done. It's made for a very specific use case. So if you integrate that and you see like, wow, this is way better than you know reviewing on Dropbox or giving notes on Notion or Apple Notes or whatever it might be, then it's like, well, this is a piece that you just integrate into your, your the ecosystem of how yeah. you guys work. So I would just do it bite-sized and not try and uh, drink from the fire hose, but you know, <laughs> take little sips and, and try yeah. it a little at a time. That is a good tip because uh, yeah, we usually are like, let's just switch everything to it. And then we'll be like, oh, we'll do it after this project's done. Or we're mm -hmm. a little bit busy this week. Let's wait until the next one sort of thing. And it isn't until somebody's like, we have to use this uh, before we actually do it. But yeah, I am noticing that a platform like Notion being so open, it is hard to learn, but also a good thing to know because I notice, uh, say like accounting or different types of mm -hmm. task management software. There's so many of them out there that you might have features that you enjoy from one of them and it's missing this, but then you have to have the compatibility of another one or it's exclusive to this platform. Only this one works with Slack and this and that, that uh, having like an open platform like, like Notion is, uh, is one that I've come to enjoy. And I know like the options, there's even like a database now of templates that people have created that anybody can download and start to use right away, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. 
Um, on the YouTube side of things, like what have you learned the most uh, from the platform as someone who has started creating videos in the past couple of years uh, on your personal channel and also like the affiliate marketing side of Kit? Because um, my, my buddy who runs iSetups, he was like, he's like, Matthew and Cena's Kit page has more views than Marquez's Kit page. Um, and, <laughs> and we're like, and I saw in the numbers, I was like, that's crazy. Like those numbers in the, in the world of affiliate marketing are like a dream for any tech company, which makes sense that tech companies are reaching out now. So for me, like I, I've been working in the commercial space for a long time, making TV advertisements for products for a long time. Like that was my bread and butter. And then only a few years ago, about four or five years ago, uh, when we started The Future, which is a uh, creative content uh, education where we're trying to teach all the things that we've learned from that space from branding and advertising um, then i realized wow there's this open platform called youtube where you can make content on here and then there's an audience that might be willing to listen so the past few years i've just been practicing and trying to understand the platform as i'm sure you have and many other content creators have and the way i look at it is like okay well there's you, the message, there's the audience, the thing that they want, and then the platform. And I think most of the time, content creators, and this was me early on, it's like, they just think it's about you. It's like what you have to say. And eventually you realize, oh, well, there's an audience that you have to serve. But most people stop there. Most people don't understand how the platform actually works. And I think I've invested a lot of time in the past few years trying to understand how that works from the SEO aspects, yeah. uh, from uh, retention, how that works, uh, the relationship between Google and YouTube and other platforms, like how does the web work? How does uh, SEO work on a global scale? And then how does that affect something that's searchable like YouTube? And why is YouTube such a unique platform compared to all the other social platforms that are not searchable? And so those are like the big things that I've been trying to understand, trying to take little sips uh, from this big ocean that is uh, YouTube and how it works and, and understand different things. So uh, I'll break it down for each of the things. There's the content part and then there's the platform part, right? Yeah. So the content part, um, I, I do a lot of research. Uh, uh, first, obviously, I try to work on an idea, something that I'm just excited about. So for my desk video that I made back in early 2019, and that was something where it's like, you know, I need to uh, refresh my room. I started just looking up some YouTube videos and realized, wow, there's a whole community of this stuff. There's a niche here that people <laughs> just do desktop stuff. And I think I, that's where I saw some of your stuff on there uh, too, Justin. So I was, you know, I'm, I'm using Pinterest. I'm just saving a bunch of things. Yeah. I'm like, huh, there's not that many videos of the things that I personally like. Yeah. Like there's there's a lot of these crazy RGB video game setups, which are cool, Like, but that's not me. And then there are uh, a lot of content creators more on the female side that do all these cool DIY setups. And I'm kind of somewhere in between where it's like yeah. I, I have a certain aesthetic and I want a certain um, uh, uh, function with, with the tech that I'm building here. So I, I, I kind of looked at that and saw that's opportunity. That's white space. There is no designer in the space that's making great content um, in yeah. this niche. So I was like, you know what? I bet I can make one of these videos. So it was just a fun personal project. <laughs> I wanted to, so I started documenting everything and I started looking, it's like, what are, what is everybody else doing? And I started emulating all the best parts of probably 10 or 20 different videos that I really like. And I compiled it into my own. And this was a tip that I heard from a uh, marketing su uh, school with Eric Sue and Neil Patel uh, many, many years ago on their podcast. They said something about blog posts because they're all about SEO. And they say, if you want to succeed in SEO and like really move up in rankings, just do research when you're looking up a blog. You see, okay, this blog has 2,000 words. This has 3,000 words. Do that, but better. Add more words. Add add uh, another layer of something that um, is not talked about in the space right now in the top 10. And so I, I kind of took that in video. It's like, here's the niche. Here's where everybody's currently playing. Where is the white space that I can come yeah. into? And so that's that's what I did. And then I combined all of those things into that one video. I had no idea that it was going to take off like it did. Uh, you know, I was expecting like, oh, this is going to be a fun, cool video. And I was just happy with the production of it. Yeah. I didn't really think it was going to take off at all because at the time I probably had 500 subscribers on my YouTube channel. Um, and most of that was just people following me through the future, our main channel. 
I think that's a cool so, perspective, though, because you you researched it, like you did your homework on where there was a bit of a void in the industry, um, but at the same time you went into it just as like a a true passion project, like not overthinking it, uh, but at the same time doing research to to kind of structure how the video was sorted out, which is why it did very well. And like IKEA is something that is that is done all the time. Like uh, we see desk setups, uh, mm -hmm. Ikea, like over the years, um, the wood tops and back in 2015, I think a lot of people were doing like the kitchen countertops, the Alex drawers, like Alex might've been around for maybe a decade now, or at least uh, it actually uh, yeah. sold out like recently. And people on Facebook marketplace were like offering to pay resale for those Alex drawers. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a really cool perspective. And I learned a lot just from the past couple minutes of you talking about like kind of the mentality behind videos. Um, the problem that someone like myself mm -hmm. has haven't done YouTube since I was like 12 years old is I'm very stubborn on thinking of doing things the exact same way. And with the algorithm mm -hmm. changing so much, the way the SEO works and the platform itself evolving a lot, especially when I was in my teenage years, I was really reluctant to change. I just got used to doing things a certain way and kept doing that. So it wasn't until I was maybe around 20 that I, try to be very aware of, of, uh, trying to make the changes and we're still trying to, as we go. Um, but I think that's a really mm -hmm. cool perspective that you gave us. Um, and yeah, what I liked about your desk setup is you didn't go overboard with the spending. Everything was affordable and out of hands grasp. And with the transition to working from home, it's made, I mean, personally, I was, uh, I came across Justin's video a few years ago and it was from a uh, desk makeover setup. And mm -hmm. one note I actually realized you said you used to to do list or, um, to do notes right when you're getting your task done you write it to write it down yeah i just put it put it on a post-it note that's yeah it. i uh so mm -hmm. i came from monday.com to do list uh everything mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm doing the same thing as well i just write it down on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and i find that's really working for my efficiency what's uh what's a productivity hack that you've kept up with the longest yeah, so for the, the biggest productivity hack that I've kept up really is just using post-it notes and really just keeping a simple to-do. Before, I would use post-it notes for many, many years, but then I also kept a, a bullet system journal uh, where, you know, it's, it's the same thing where there's a little system in there where it's like um, you checked it off, you push it to later. And I, yeah. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. that for a long time. But honestly, just keeping a post-it note in front of me every day and I just plot out here's Monday, here's Tuesday, here's Wednesday, and I just have it in front of me. And at the end of the week, I check all them all off and I throw it away. Having something physical for me in front of you is very important. And being able to see it all the time is very, very important. So whether that's analog or digital, yeah. I think it's important that it's a place that you're going to look at every day. And I want to give you one more example because, let's see. Another habit that I, you know, I've been good in in the past and then fell off is working out. So for working out, it's just like you know, so I, it's Justin, always been good when I've that. had accountability, right? You know, like if you have a buddy, somebody who's gonna be like, dude, wake up, go go do your work, like stop yeah. being lazy. Um, but for the longest time, it's like my, especially being at home, it's like I'll work out one day out of seven. And it's like well, that's kind of, and and then I lose track. I don't know how well I've done. So Asians have a good metabolism though, so it's often hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never worked well, out. Like I used to play some ice hockey and stuff, but I, I've never actually like gone to the gym for more than a, like a day to run on the treadmill and play on my phone. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and for me, it's like, I used to be very good at it and it just, I just fell off. But these days, because I'm at home, it's like, this is a list of like that past 11 weeks. Oh, wow. of me working out um, five to seven days a week. So because this pad is right in front of me on my desk, I have to log it. It's like, how, uh, how many minutes did I work out today? And I just do that. And it's so simple because I wake up and it's one of the first things I see. So yeah. I know in the first half of my day, I have to do some kind of workout. And because it's here, it's just like, oh, it's easy. And I, after doing this for, for 11 weeks now and I'm looking at it's like dude how many minutes have I put in it's like over a thousand you know it's like the I'm and I'm just transferring this over to notion now where yeah. I've created this analog thing into a digital space so I could log all of my workouts see the total minutes I've worked out per week and uh man I'm, do you it's, find it's the, a system. In, it's just like, do you find you're gaining the the mindset that you wanted to accomplish with working out like what's, uh, At, when you started it, when you were like, man, I need to start working now. This is uh, something that's bothering me. Now that you've done mm -hmm. 11 weeks straight, do you feel that you've gotten the benefits out of it? With being oh, present, yeah. with clients, with uh, being a leader at work, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, I mean, just for me, um, because I'm on camera all the time, it's like I could tell when my face gets chubby, right? It's like whenever I gain weight, like the first place you can see it is yeah. on my face. So uh, whenever I see that, like that's one little note or, you know, if my energy is very low, it's like, well, it's probably because I'm not working out a whole lot or not dieting properly. Yeah. So um, after doing this for a long time, it's like I, I've lost about eight pounds. Uh, I've been taking progress pictures, which is very important because you can't see the incremental updates every day. You need to kind of see it over a couple of months. And um, energy wise, like I feel I feel great. So all of these things have been helpful for me, but it wouldn't have started unless I had some kind of system that was just in my face all the time. That was very easy to hold myself accountable since I don't have a, a you know, a buddy to, to really mm -hmm. kick my butt on that. Yeah. Do you have a filter that you run your like let's say um, a project has to get pushed what sort of filter do you run that through before you push it oh before i push it back mm -hmm. oh. um you know i try to only prioritize uh one or two things at a time I, i've been reading this book recently called uh essentialism and uh greg greg McEwen, who's the author there's a part in there he said you know priority used to be singular for the longest time and it wasn't only until i think the early 1900s where it became priorities it was never pr plural and he's like he's gone into all these agencies and workplaces where it's like priority one priority two priority three priority 30 like wh what the hell is a priority anymore so in reading this book which i'm not done with yet he's like well what's the one thing you could be doing right now that's going to have the most impact because yeah. In today's age, it's really easy to get pulled in 20 different directions and it's easy to feel like you're productive, but really you're just busy and you're just busy doing a bunch of meaningless things. So you have to kind of stop and prioritize the things that are going to have the most impact. One way that you could do that is just using the simple Eisenhower matrix, which I've shared, I think, before on some of my content, which is just it's just a graph of uh, impact to effort. And all you're doing is taking all of the things that you think you should be doing, plotting it all out there relative to their importance, meaning like what can I get done right now and what's going to have the most impact? Do that first and get that out of the way. The things that are going to take longer, plan for and then plan for that down the road. Everything else you could probably delegate or just get rid of your off of your plate altogether because if you're spending your time being busy doing things that don't really matter, that aren't going to make a long-term impact for you, why even do it sure yeah the um i think uh the other question that i had like with the whole like work-life balance thing is i noticed um you mentioned that you wake up at 6 30 each morning um brandon wakes up a few days a week to work out i'm someone who doesn't wake up any time before 9 30 in the morning and then i'll work until like <laughs> midnight 1 a.m to edit sort of thing there's no real like routine mm -hmm. and i've wanted to kind of free up that extra three hours in the morning um and stuff but i'm the kind who just like wakes up at 9 30 i'll grab reach over and grab my phone and i'll answer emails while i'm still laying in bed um that kind of thing what mm -hmm. what's like your kind of schedule in those say three hours that i'm that i'm missing out on <laughs> yeah and Obviously, that's changed a whole lot since working from home because that video I produced before was based off of my time at work, meaning like I have some time in the morning that's precious to me and I'm just holding that um, space, that three hours in the morning, whether that's for writing or reading or working out or all three of those yeah. things. So I kept that very precious because I know the moment I step into the office, I have to deal with everybody that's there because I'm, I'm yeah. more of a manager over there. I have to have a lot of meetings and talk to a lot of people and guess what all of the time that it should be going towards personal development and my growth i don't have that inside yeah. the office necessarily so um that's why i had it that way before now because we're all working from home my um my my situation has has shifted I still wake up relatively early, but I don't have any alarms anymore. Like I turn off all my alarms and I just wake up when my body is ready. And yeah. usually I, I still wake up after about seven or eight hours of sleep. Um, but I, I realize that my time is kind of shifting towards the later end, you know, where it's like I'm waking up a little bit eight, later, like 7.30 or 8. And I'm going to sleep a little bit later and I'm just starting to get into that midnight uh, owl kind of uh, <laughs> works out so it's shifting and it's it's yeah. different it's just because um 
how I work and then balancing uh, my, my life at home, it's it's it, it has to change. But yeah, it was it was the reason why I had that before is just to protect the precious space that yeah. I have towards investing in myself. So six now thirty and nine thirty was always just like personal development, uh, none of the work stuff, right? Or do you do you let emails? Do you do like emails while you're doing eating breakfast, or is it until you get to work at around the the start of the day? I, I try to reserve looking at emails until later in the day. I mean, I get tempted if there's a big yeah. project that has to go on, then <laughs> mm. definitely I'll, I'll be ch uh, checking there. But if I know there's nothing pressing, I try to resist as long as possible from looking at my inbox. Yeah. And um, that's been very, very helpful for me because I realize as soon as I see 20 things in my inbox, I feel like I have to respond <laughs> yeah. or sort all of them. And it's just like, it's maddening. Anything where there's an open... Uh, to do for me and I, I know it's there it's like th that stresses me out if I have so many so I try to limit my exposure to that of things to do and I try to like keep myself contained it's like okay this period of time I'm just going to work out I'm not going to worry about anything else yeah. I'm not going to try and look at emails in between reps or sets none <laughs> of that stuff it's like I'm here to focus on this thing once that's done I will close that I'll stop thinking about working out for the rest of the day and then I'll focus on work or here's this period for reading and writing. I'll block out 30 minutes to an hour to do that. And I'll, I'll just focus on that. I'm trying to limit myself from being distracted because uh, distractions are everywhere and it's easy to get um, pulled away. As uh, someone who's heard the advice, your morning starts the night before. What are some things you do before bed? <laughs> I think that was the one who made that up because I don't have a morning routine. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I said that in my last video. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. That's because, well, it pretty much does because once you start working 12 to 1, That's true. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty much the morning after. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the, morn the morning starts the night before. Uh, what is like kind of your, your nighttime routine? Like say the after dinner to going to bed. Like is it time to video edit it? I know a lot of creators love to edit at night because they think that's like when mm -hmm. you're focused in you get to see all the colors and it's like dark in the room and all you see is your content uh what's kind of your your evening routine or preparation for the day after yeah uh lately because i've been working at home i do feel uh, more energy or focus going later into the night but it depends on the stage of the project so if i'm editing and i'm getting towards the end of a post-production of finishing a project then i do like working later hours if it's in the earlier part of the days where uh, or earlier part of the projects, I shift into the early part of the day. So if I'm doing the critical thinking of how am I going to, uh, what's the story behind this? Yeah. Well, what What is the big idea here? And I'm mapping all that stuff out. I love being in the middle of the day or where it's very, very bright. So it depends on the phase of the project. I shift and, and, and move around like that. But usually in the evening, some of the habits that I do is when I'm done working, I just clean up my space. I, I try to keep that and organize that and, and tuck things away because coming in to a fresh space in the morning is, is very helpful just to be able to sit down and yeah. have that space to think. Because <laughs> like I t told you earlier, it's like when I see an open to do or something that's like left and not complete, that stresses me out until it's complete. So if that's visible in front of me, that means like, oh shoot, I got to do this workout here. And then yeah. uh, I got to finish writing the script here. And then I, and it's like, that's just, it's too much. So when I arrive in, uh, I look at my to-do list in the morning, it's like, okay, what did I plot out the, the day before? What's left over? And let me think about what do I need to, to do today? And then I just take it one piece at a time because otherwise it's, I'm just gonna be frazzled and get nothing done. <laughs> if I send you a picture of my week old new desk, you're going to be, you're going to be horrified. It's like, it's like beyond, it's beyond messy. Um, and if Trevor could hear this uh, right now, he would laugh at it because my whole house is just like, it'll be clean for a video. Like in the video, like when the photographer came, they put everything in the hallway and it's just like, there's nothing, like nothing at all. And, um, and he's been to my house enough times over the past two to three years to see how, like, how, how would you describe the mess um, of like my work and home slash living by myself type of style? I'd say you're definitely ready for your own office. Your business has evolved to that point. <laughs> it's uh, his, how, his condo is his office, his home, his workspace, <laughs> his kitchen. I mean, it's, it's everything. So, like yeah. some days I can't cook just because there's so much stuff on the countertop like there would be the camera or a memory card and then the the sky panel would be where i'm supposed to sit um and then one of the chairs dining chairs might be in the office because we use that to sit on for the video there there is no like separation so i think this podcast especially mm -hmm. and in this episode i've learned a lot from what like an effective 
mm-hmm. lifestyle of someone working in creative in LA um, is doing. And I, and yeah, it's uh, it definitely needs, I, I can't see it changing anytime soon until I actually start to take some action. Um, I think at this age- Justin's workflow is very like, he just gets down and works. That's what I've seen. From listening to you and how you talk, it's, it's very like uh, mm-hmm. you've eliminated distractions, which first of all is really hard to do with everything in your face all the time. So props and in to LA, to like we're living and in a place where there's not many distractions. Do you totally. know where Victoria, BC mm-hmm. is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's not many distractions for people our age. Like there's not too much to do. I mean, he works in real estate. Um, and then in my case, working in YouTube, digital tech and whatever it is, uh, most of the time we're traveling out to stuff. Nothing really comes here. Uh, but working online, we can work anywhere. Um, but yeah, my style of work is definitely trying to do 15 things at the same time and like edit in terms of videos i'll have like 10 of them being edited at the exact same time and one of them might be one that has to be go out in three hours the other one doesn't get uploaded for six weeks uh that kind of thing right um in, right. in your kind of structure do you like to finish one thing and then move on to the next one or do you like to do multiple have multiple things open at once that you can chip away at and then slowly push each one of the completion phase and which kind of structure do you suggest um for an effective workflow at the end Right. So I want to make one thing clear. There's two. I don't think that you should feel guilty for what works for you, right? Because everybody works a little differently. But one thing that has been very apparent for me is two different kinds of mentality. There's the manager mentality and the maker mentality. And those two things don't necessarily blend together. So I'd imagine, Justin, since you've grown your team, you've gone from being a maker and now you're more of a manager because you're trying to manage the output of multiple people and balance a lot of different things. So here's what uh, the day of a maker looks like, right? You get a creative brief or you get a task to do and it requires like half day or a full day or a whole week of just critical thinking so that you can synthesize an effective thought, an effective solution, right? And that requires a lot of time of incubation, researching and connecting the dots before you get something that's going to be good. Yeah. That's how a maker thinks. You need that space. Any disruption in that is going to is going to slow that person down. A manager, however, works on 30-minute blocks. Here's a 30-minute call, here's a 30-minute meeting, here's a 30-minute checkup, here's a 30-minute this and that. And that's if you look at the calendar of somebody who's more of a manager, you'll see that all the color stripes yeah. in their day, right? And those are two different mentalities. So it sounds like you're probably still straddling somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, so you got to think about that. And, and I've had to deal with this too because I'm still responsible for a team, but I'm also responsible for authoring my own content. For sure. I try to protect those things. If I'm going to work, I turn off Slack, I turn off emails, and it's like, I'm going to work for four hours or I'm going to work this whole day yeah. um, and take no meetings because where you lose time is in context switching. So every time you switch a task, guess what? You have to war- You have to cool down from the last one and then warm up and get acquainted. Like, what was the context of this? What, you know, like, what was I doing last? And then you spend half the time trying to get back up to speed and then, well... Was that really that efficient? For sure. So one tip that I would have for you, which I implemented in my day or in my week, is just pick a day in the week where you're just making. No meetings. Like for me, like on my Calendly, like how I set up all of my schedules, like Tuesday is blocked out. No one can ever book a meeting with me on Tuesday because that's my making day. So at least I I have that protective. And uh, company-wide, what we try and do is we only have meetings on Mondays. That way we plan out everything on Monday and everybody just works for the whole week. It's always like an admin day because like over the emails, I think the most are on Monday morning and we're in the Pacific time Mm -hmm. zone. A lot of the business comes from the East Coast. Um, In Asia, they they'll email you any time of the day, like three in the morning. They'll start asking why you're not replying. Um, And sometimes I will reply uh, half awake. But yeah, I think, um, (laughs) yeah, that's that's a good point, actually, uh, because with. My mentality is that, um, well, I I started YouTube when I was 12. So back then it was like a hobby and and like you just do it. You don't really think of it as like a future career path or a viable business that you can employ and and like get an office space and all that. And then eventually transition into that uh, while I was still a student in university. And then I dropped out and then we had to figure out how to build a company out of it. And I'd never run a company. I'd also never worked for a company either. Um, So trying Mm -hmm. to figure out that brand new workflow was definitely a bit of a weird one. But at the same time, YouTube's one of those things where uh, you get an email and they're like, in last year's case, we flew maybe between 90 and 100 times. Um, so it was hard wow. to implement like a real 
workflow because you would come back for two days and then next thing you know, you're off again um, and you got to pack all your stuff and you have all these deadlines and then the product releases and all that. So it was always like an ongoing new product here, a new campaign that has to be mm. done in five days. The other one, you might have a month or you have like your retainer deals that go over. So the, the struggle, I think like right now um, is, is trying to turn a kind of a reactive business like Brandon likes to call the real <laughs> estate industry into a more structured workflow. Absolutely. It's Tetris. That's all it is. So you have a <laughs> yeah. bunch of blocks that are coming down and you just got to understand like, how yeah. is the best, how can I organize this the best so that I don't have any gaps here? I don't have any downtime and I'm just, everything fits as, as snug and as best as possible. Yeah. So I, I think that's all it is. So you might spend some time uh, later and look at all of the tasks that you normally do in a normal week and categorize them. Like what are making, what is managing? And then how can you bunch those things together where you have whole sprints of just making and then other parts where it's like maybe there's only three hours in your day where you're checking your email and doing yeah. management For and sure. I, I think it you can even establish that with uh the sponsors and the clients that you work with and just uh, establish office hours it's i think it's as simple as that and um and you just have to respect your own time because if you don't do that no one else is going to respect it people are going to put stuff on your plate all the time if you let them yeah. Right now it's like, um, I, I would see the making time. A lot of it is like, uh, so we do the, the regular nine 30 to five 30 of like filming and just the general stuff. Like every day is a little bit different. Some days there might be more news and we'll edit right away. Um, and then my mm -hmm. editing time is usually after dinner from about 8 PM to, to midnight. And then the next morning is like just the finishing thing. But I know like long term that's not exactly feasible because you're working for however many hours that is in a day. And then the right. only thing you're doing is sleeping, working, traveling, and then it's just a combination of that. And I've noticed already at, at age 23, the, the body definitely does not have <laughs> as much energy as when I was 19. So it's just yeah. going to get, it's just going to get worse as I get a little bit older. Um, It'll get worse if you don't take care of it. Yeah, because I know. The, mo <laughs> the moment, the moment we're born, we're slowly dying every day. That's it's true. just as simple as that. So it's just like we're decaying already. <laughs> so if you realize that it's like you can't you can't just keep adding up and like have this hockey stick of, you know, production yeah. of actual doing stuff. So you got to figure out, like, how am I going to say no to more than I'm saying yes? And then and starting to control that flow of things that get thrown your way. <laughs> Yeah. So we have, we're coming up on the hour now. Um, we just mm -hmm. have one last question and that is what is next for your personal channel? I'm, I'm personally very excited to see all the new content that you, mm -hmm. that you create. Are you planning to, to create more videos more frequently or, uh, what's kind of the, the next for the Matthew and Cena channel? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty slow. <laughs> I maybe produce like three or four videos in a whole I mean, year. You get more views than, uh, than 10 videos from a regular tech channel. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm just lucky like that. You know, I, 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 um, for me, the, the next big project, I, I told myself this year, it's like, wow, 2019 was great for that personal channel. Yeah. Let me see if I can double my production, meaning I have to just make eight videos this year. I think I'm on two or three. I'm, I'm way behind. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, we try to do eight in a month. <laughs> um, but like I mentioned, y your views on three videos, I think, is more than more than half our year. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, that it's a personal thing, right? I, yeah. I still run the other channel with uh, Chris Doe. So we're producing five pieces of content a yeah. week over there. So it's, it, you know, it's it's not like I'm not doing that elsewhere. It's like there's two other channels that we're running. And then so for my personal channel, the, the next big project is a big DIY project. So I just got a bunch of supplies yesterday. So I have these big oak sheets that were, me and my wife were going to cut down and actually construct something from scratch. And, um, this is coming from her wanting to learn how to do woodworking and furniture building. Yeah. And I'm like, hmm, this would be fun. So now she's just, she's really into it. We both have a project that we're going to work on and we're redesigning her space because this office used to be for both of us. She gave it up and started working in the living room. So now we're focusing on her space. And I think that's going to be super fun. And we're just going to document that in the process. Looking forward to that. Yeah. No, like, um, with the, with the workspaces, uh, like a female workspace makeover would be would be another area that not many people have covered. I notice a lot of creators in the beauty space they, they they don't really have like a desk set up. They just like to work on the dining table, work on the couch. And for someone like myself who is into tech, I'm kind of like, well, I feel like I gotta have. I can't I can't edit on the couch. I don't edit on the plane. I don't edit in hotels and anything. I gotta have like my my space that I go back to. I feel like the amount of time it takes to do something. Um, 
on the go or in a not like focus setting, it's, it takes double the time as to if I just saved it for when I got home and just did it all in the main setup. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, thanks so much for joining us on this podcast. Um, I'm a huge fan of your content, of course. And uh, thanks for the inspiration on our last setup makeover. Um, the, the person really enjoyed it. The paint job wasn't the best. Uh, we, we usually have the, the, the person who's in the makeover painted themselves because I'm really bad at all the handyman stuff. Like I can't, I'm not great at putting together furniture, woodworking, have no clue. Any of that stuff just kind of have to leave it to the experts um but yeah the paint job on that one was a bit rough um <laughs> but yeah thank you so much yeah, hey you're you, welcome Matthew. man and i'm a big fan of your guys work as well um keep thank cranking you. on that stuff because i draw a lot of inspiration from that as well so thank you for that and thanks for having me but otherwise, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Feature Podcast. We definitely learn a lot, uh, both in terms of the productivity side and the workspace. And as someone like myself who always wants to improve workspaces in the setup makeover, people like Matthew really bring inspiration from a design standpoint and how to mm -hmm. utilize like different pieces as well as the software importance in conjunction with your actual workspace. Yeah, I find that productivity is something that's always malleable and evolving. And there was some tips in there that I could integrate into my own productivity schedule. And I'm sure later on, I'll be able to integrate other things as well.